Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Shouse and Associates in our Get Farsighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR Federal Acquisitions Regulations is the rule book that the federal government must follow when making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contracting ex experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We will post all the recordings on our website and YouTube channel, where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in the series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. Now a bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And now we would like to let you know about some ways to reach government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jennifershouse.com. Also, please join us for our signature event on April 20th at the Kennedy Center. U.S. State Department will be available to meet with you. We expect 150 federal contractors and we really hope to see you there. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, Ed Delisle. You can find his information on the screen here. And today we are covering FAR Part 9 with Ed. Thank you for joining us today. We're really thankful for your, uh, your participation in the series. The floor is now yours. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon, where we will uh, discuss FAR Part 9, Contractor Qualifications. Uh, as we heard a few moments ago, the FAR does, in fact, uh, set forth the various uh, rules of the road as it relates to how the federal government buys things. Uh, and it does this in several different ways. Uh, it tells contractors and vendors uh, or prospective contractors and vendors to the government what their rights and responsibilities are as, re as it relates uh, to federal government contracts. And it also tells government officials including uh, source selection authorities and contracting officers, what their responsibilities are when it comes to buying uh, goods and services uh, from the public, from contractors and vendors who want to sell to them. FAR Part 9 is no different. It covers both of these things. Uh, it covers what contractors need to do to qualify for a federal government contract, and it also covers what the government needs to do to assure that a contractor does in fact qualify for a particular opportunity. If you can advance the slide, please. All right, what we have here is uh, FAR Part 9 all on one slide. And what we will do uh, over the course of the next 45 minutes to an hour is uh, cover each one of these uh, respective portions of FAR Part 9. Not all uh, sections of uh, the FAR are created equal, uh, and that includes subparts of the FAR as well. We'll spend a little bit more time on several of these particular subparts uh, versus others. Uh, we'll spend a decent amount of time talking about item number one, responsible prospective contractors. Uh, we'll also spend a good amount of time talking about debarment, suspension, and ineligibility, uh, along with contractor team arrangements, which is FAR 9.6, and I spend a good bit of my time dealing with FAR 9.6, but we will, in fact, cover each one of the items identified here, one through seven. Okay, if we can advance the slide. Let's start at the top. Subpart 9.1, Responsible Prospective Contractors. So what we see here is the policy of the government as it relates to responsibility. Uh, the government shall not issue a contract award to a contractor absent an affirmative determination of responsibility by a source selection authority or a contracting officer. So the government must consider responsibility as part of any selection uh, process 
And if a government um, officer, a contracting officer, source selection uh, authority makes the decision to issue an award to a contractor, that in fact represents an affirmative determination that a responsibility check has been performed and that the contractor has qualified under each one of the uh, prongs that we will see uh, coming up as it relates to responsibility. Uh, this particular subpart of the FAR also uh, makes a specific point uh, regarding the selection of a contractor based upon lowest price. And what it says is that the selection based upon dollars alone can be what they call a false economy if that contractor is incapable of adequately performing, which of course is why there is a stress here in subpart 9.1 on responsibility. It's also why, uh, by the way, the federal government does not always uh, select contractors where price is the primary driver for selection. In fact, there's an entire section of the FAR, FAR Part 15, entitled Contracting by Negotiation, uh, which identifies factors other than price, uh, which when used most of the time, uh, in fact, I would uh, go as far as to say almost all of the time, factors other than price are uh, more important in the selection process. Um, and in fact, those who participate in uh, federal government contracting uh, know that the government's use of uh, lowest responsive, responsible, responsible bidders or lowest price technically uh, acceptable is uh, in fact is favored. In many instances, we see at state and local levels, this whole concept of lowest responsible and responsive bidders being uh, selected. In the federal uh, context, it's uh, disfavored in a way that differs uh, very often from what you see at the local and uh, the state level. If you're a small business uh, that, are, that is performing work for the federal government, responsibility can take on a bit of a, of a different uh, twist because of uh, FAR subpart 19.6. So if a contracting officer or source selection authority finds a small business concern non-responsible as part of a review process, that matter will then be uh, referred to the Small Business Association, uh, in many uh, instances the SBA, which will then decide whether that small business should receive what, what's called a certificate of competency for the purpose of satisfying the government's responsibility uh, review. We can advance the slide, please. Okay, here what we see are the, the standards that are identified in FAR uh, subpart 9.1 as it relates to responsibility. And as a uh, contracting official reviewing a bidder proposal, these are the items that that government official will be reviewing to determine whether or not a contractor or a prospective contractor or vendor to the government is in fact responsible. Uh, the things that will be reviewed are things such as adequate financial resources to perform. Does the contractor have that or the ability to obtain it? Uh, delivery and performance schedules, obviously very important. Does the uh, prospective contractor have the ability to comply? What sort of performance record does the prospective contractor have? There are exceptions to that. If, for example, uh, a contractor has never performed a particular, uh, it, it, the type of work that the uh, government is seeking on that, for that particular opportunity, it's not necessarily uh, a disqualifier for the contractor. There are exceptions, of course, but uh, generally speaking, this will be something, the performance record will be something that will be reviewed by the um, contracting authority. What sort of integrity business ethics does the prospective contractor have? Is that contractor uh, on the suspended or debarred list? And that's something that the government will look at. Does it have the necessary organization experience, accounting, operational controls, technical skills, or the ability to obtain them? Okay, another important factor. Does it have the necessary production equipment facilities or ability to obtain them? In many, as it relates to many of these factors, you see that 
does the contractor have it or the ability to obtain it? The prospective contractor, in order to be deemed responsible, does not necessarily have to have the ability to satisfy every aspect of a given opportunity, uh, provided that it can provide what's necessary as identified here uh, if an award is to occur. And, and the ways in which it can satisfy uh, some of these prongs is, for example, by incorporating subcontractor assistance as part of its offer to the government. It can, in fact, oftentimes use the assistance of a subcontractor to satisfy uh, those things for which it cannot provide itself. Or a prospective contractor could include things in its offer to the government, such as contingent hire agreements, uh, which effectively uh, mean that a person that, that's being identified as important as part of the selection process will be hired in the event an award is made. Uh, so while a prospective uh, contractor may not have everything uh, that it needs as set forth here, as long as it has the ability to obtain uh, those things that are necessary and can demonstrate that, uh, then it can be deemed responsible depending upon the circumstances. And of course, all circumstances are different. You see number seven here, otherwise qualified and eligible. Very often, uh, there will be criteria that are opportunity specific. So every opportunity is different and the qualities that a responsible uh, contractor may have will differ depending upon that opportunity. Now, many of the things that you see here uh, are items that a source selection authority or a contracting officer can identify through the individual selection process that's chosen by the agency for a given opportunity, whether it's an RFQ process or an RFP process, many of the issues that are raised here uh, can be addressed through that process. There are also a public, um, there's also public information available to a source selection authority or a contracting officer that will allow him or her or them uh, to identify whether or not some of these items have been satisfied, uh, whether it's through uh, FAPIS, the Federal Awardee Performance and Integrity Information System that's available to the government or individually through the System for Award Management or uh, CPARS information uh, that will identify past performance history. Uh, all of this information becomes important uh, and is uh, viewed by a contracting official for the purpose of determining whether a contractor or a prospective contractor qualifies by virtue of being a responsible contractor for any given opportunity. Advance the slide, please. Generally speaking, uh, it's a prime contractor's responsibility uh, to vouch for the responsibility of its subcontractors, though there will be times that the government may consider uh, the impact of a subcontractor's responsibility uh, based upon a particular offer made uh, to the government. And in terms of whether or not the government will uh, delve into a subcontractor's responsibility specifically, questions that you see here become uh, important, and in particular, the first one, how vital is that subcontractor to performance? This is an issue that I deal with uh, very often when it comes to small business set-aside contracts, especially in areas uh, like construction, where up to 85% of the work on a set-aside contract can be performed by a subcontractor. So it becomes very important in an instance like that to understand, if you're the government, the uh, responsibility of that subcontracting uh, partner for that particular opportunity. Also, I mentioned FAPIS a little while ago. There, um, FAPIS primarily is, in fact it is, uh, prime contractor driven. Uh, if you're a prime, and this is something to, uh, to understand, and you have a problem with a subcontractor as it relates to either performance or perhaps that subcontractor ends up being uh, suspended or debarred, or there's some other problem similar to that, that issue could end up uh, being or having a negative effect uh, and or attributed to you, the prime, 
and appear in SAPIS as such. So if a contracting uh, officer or source selection authority is doing a review of you, information pertaining to uh, a, a prior subcontractor to you could appear in what that contracting officer is uh, viewing. And so it's important for yourself to monitor uh, information that might appear in a place like SAPIS for your own benefit to understand uh, what information is being conveyed publicly about your company. Uh, if we can advance the slide, please. All right, so that's FAR 9.1 responsibility. Let's uh, go on to subpart 9.2, which uh, relates to qualification, uh, qualifications requirements. So there are going to be uh, times where the government will require uh, prospective contractors to have their products tested ahead of time and effectively to pre-qualify uh, bidders or manufacturers. You see references here to QBO, QML. There's also QPO, uh, qualified products list. And these lists are, um, are made uh, publicly available. You can find them. Uh, they're issued by uh, GS. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Sorry, I just had some technical difficulties. Okay. All right. I can advance the slide for you. Okay. So, can I, you can hear me at this point? Yes. I apologize. Not sure what the system is doing. Okay. That's okay. So, let's see where we are. We were on. Um, you can go back, please. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. We had a few technical difficulties. We're back on. Um, when we left each other, we were uh, beginning to to discuss um, subpar subpart 9.2 qualifications requirements. And as I started saying before uh, we dropped, uh, there will be circumstances where the government will require contractors to have their products um, tested and qualified uh, pre-award. That does occur. Um, it doesn't occur that often just simply based upon my experience, um, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, if the government is going to um, go through this pre-qualification process, what effectively occurs is a restriction on competition. Uh, and in order for the government to in fact proceed in this particular fashion, uh, it, it will require to, uh, be required to provide a written justification and it must use the least restri restrictive qualifications possible um, for purposes of um, qualifying uh, 
prospective contractors to be participants and to uh, and to proceed. There are uh, there are areas where one can view uh, lists that are already available uh, through both GSA and the Department of Defense. Uh, the government also maintains maintains instructions on how the qualification procedures uh, work as it relates to um, qualifications requirements. They can be found at the federal standardization. There's a federal, what's called a federal uh, standardization manual. There's also what's called a defense standardization uh, annual. You see, um, you see qualifications requirements primarily in military or space applications. Um, don't see them a lot in uh, the areas where I generally practice, but if you were to, uh, to go through uh, FAR subpart 9.2, what you'll see is a litany of requirements that the government must go through in order to restrict competition to those whose, pro uh, whose products can uh, qualify based on whatever the requirements or restrictions are. There are notices to the public, uh, a need for adequate time for bidders or manufacturers to qualify if there's already a qualification list of some type that's out there, um, there's the requirement uh, uh, for periodic outreach on the part of the, um, the procuring agency to assure that others uh, can see to it uh, that if, if their products are similar in some way, that they can potentially qualify themselves. Okay, so if we can advance the slide. So that was uh, subpar, uh, subpart, uh, FAR subpart 9.2. Here we have FAR subpart 9.3, which um, is entitled First Article Testing and Approval. It's akin to subpart 9.2 uh, in that there's uh, testing of some type or qualifications of some type uh, being uh, advanced by the agency in some way as it relates to Subpart 9.2, you're talking about pre-award. If you're talking about uh, subpart 9.3, you're talking about after the fact. And um, as you see here, there will be times where before uh, proceeding outright, a contracting officer will uh, require written approval of a product uh, in order to, uh, for, for that contractor to then proceed and continue with its performance. When is it used? You see that here, uh, where I've seen this occur is relative to uh, numbered paragraph three, where the product is subject to performance uh, specifications of some type. And when the government issues uh, specifications that are performance-based, it will provide general criteria that a product must meet in order uh, to be deemed acceptable by the government. And what will happen in an instance where uh, subpart 9.3 applies, uh, the government will require uh, a, the product itself to be tested to assure that what they will continue to buy meets those performance specifications. We can advance the slide. There are certain exceptions to subpart 9.3, and you see them here. Uh, research and development is something complete and apart from uh, application of subpart 9.3. Uh, if something is typically sold in the commercial marketplace, there should be no need for uh, testing uh, in the manner in which it's set forth in subpart 9.3. Um, if there are, as they say, as it says here, complete and detailed technical specifications, even if they're performance-based, normally, you will not uh, require uh, the application of subpart 9.3. It says here, unless uh, products are, quote, uh, novel and exacting, end quote. Of course, novel and exacting is not something that's defined as part of uh, subpart 9.3. It's going to be at the discretion of the um, contracting authority. Um, uh, but generally speaking, if uh, you have a, a set of performance specifications, as I alluded to before, and as is refer referred to in number paragraph four here, there shouldn't be uh, a need necessarily to have uh, this additional testing performed and have the uh, have uh, subpart 9.3 be applicable. Um, 
but it's going to it's going to end up becoming um, uh, discretionary on the part of the government. Okay, if we can uh, advance the slide, please. All right, so let's go on to um, FAR subpart 9.4, debarment, suspension, suspension, and ineligibility. So uh, this is an area where I will become involved from time to time with clients. It is serious. The way that the policy is identified in the FAR, it states that debarment and suspension is not for the purpose of punishment. It's simply for the purpose of protecting the government and the public interest. And that would be against uh, bad actors or um, uh, as it relates to those who simply cannot refuse to follow the regulations that uh, pertain to the purchase of goods and materials. I can tell you that even though the policy is identified as such, that is, that it's not for the purpose of imposing punishment. If you are a government contractor and you are facing um, uh, debarment and suspension, it certainly feels like uh, punishment as you're going through it. And we'll talk about why that is uh, as we proceed. Um, but I can tell you that if you are uh, a government contractor that receives much of its revenues through uh, the federal or from the federal government, it's certainly going to feel like punishment to you. Uh, subpart 9.4 uh, talks about what can lead to suspension and debarment, and we're going to go through those items. Uh, and also talks about procedure. The causes and the procedure are important. We're, we're going to go through uh, both of those individually. If there are instances where the issue or problem uh, runs across different agencies. There is uh, something called the Interagency Committee on Debarment and Suspension that exists and, can, and that can become involved in the review of uh, the actions which could lead uh, to debarment, suspension, or ineligibility. Okay, if we can advance the slide. All right, so, so what does it mean if uh, you're either debarred, suspended, or deemed ineligible, or you're proposed for such? Well, it means that everyone's going to know about it because the, uh, the fact that you are debarred or suspended, for example, will appear in the system for award management. It will appear uh, to anyone who uh, searches for you through SAM, uh, so it's important to know that. And if you're uh, debar suspended or proposed for debarment or suspension, you're excluded from receiving contracts moving forward unless uh, the agency head of the agency which is responsible for debarring or suspending you or suspending you otherwise finds a compelling reason to uh, issue contracts to you moving forward. Uh, the chance of uh, there being some sort of compelling reason is slim, not surprising. The most important aspect of what we're talking about here is if you're proposed for debarment, you're effectively debarred. So until the issue or the issues uh, that uh, pertain to that proposed debarment are fully vetted between agency and uh, the contractor, you're very likely not going to receive another government contract. It's, it's guilty before being proved innocent uh, in this particular case. Um, it's a little bit different, but that's the way that it's set up. Um, and when we talk about you, uh, the you that we're talking about here isn't just the prospective uh, contractor or vendor. Okay, you're also you're, you're talking about ABC company or ABC LLC in addition to the members or owners of that company or that LLC. You're also talking about affiliates of that company or LLC. As affiliate, uh, is, that term is defined by the FAR. And affiliates could, uh, could include other companies that the owners of the debarred or suspended company are owners of or have control over. Uh, so it can have a vast impact on your ability to proceed as a federal government contractor. And again, the you isn't simply 
the company that has been proposed for suspension or debarment, it's the uh, members, owners, and all the affiliates. So it can have quite an impact. Um, despite being debarred, suspended, or proposed for such, you may, may uh, continue to perform those contracts or subcontracts that you already have at the time of the, bar the debarment or proposed debarment or suspension. You just won't get anything new. Um, now that you don't have to be permitted to continue with the contracts that you have, that will be in, at, at the government's discretion. And I've seen it both ways. In fact, I'm dealing with, uh, with one right now where uh, my client is being permitted to finish all contracts and subcontracts that it's currently uh, performing, but, but that does not have to be the case. And oh, by the way, if you are debarred, suspended, or proposed for suspension or debarment, it could also impact uh, your ability to perform as a subcontractor moving forward where the government uh, must consent to, uh, or has the ability uh, to consent to those uh, subcontractors for uh, that particular opportunity or opportunities. Again, that's moving forward. Okay, we can advance the slide. So what can lead to uh, debarment? Now, we're, I'm talking specifically about debarment here, but suspension follows the same general set of rules. Well, you're, see, you're seeing here what can lead to uh, debarment or suspension. Um, if you are a contractor and have been convicted of or have been issued a civil judgment involving any of the things that you see on the slide, that can lead uh, to a finding uh, that you should be debarred or suspended. These are all in sort of uh, attorney parlance, uh, considered crim and falsity uh, convictions. So uh, things that would go to uh, uh, the integrity or business ethics of your company. So any of these things, if there, if you are, uh, if there's a conviction or a civil judgment relating to them. Uh, that could certainly lead to suspension or debarment. Okay, we can advance the slide. This is a continuation of uh, that list. You see here, it's an interesting one, intentionally affixing made in America uh, on a product when that's not the case. Um, I have a uh, situation uh, right now involving uh, DLA. Uh, Defense Logistics Agency, where a client of mine uh, used a supplier who did exactly this, and we only found out after the fact. Big problem. Uh, the issue is whether or not we knew or should have known that this was that this was happening, and it's a major issue. Uh, so it's something that you need to be aware of, and it's specifically specifically called out in FAR Subpart 9.4. And of course. Uh, <laughs> There always seems to be a catch-all, and there's one here too. Commission of any other offense indicating lack of business integrity or business honesty that seriously and directly places the contractor in a position where its responsibility is questionable. Uh, that's your catch-all that could lead to suspension and debarment. Okay, if you can advance the slide. Okay, so um, short of a uh, conviction or civil judgment relating to any of the items that we just went over, here are some additional bases which can lead to um, suspension or debarment. Here we're talking specifically about, about debarment, um, but if any of the items shown here can be shown based upon a preponderance of the evidence. Okay, that's the standard that's involved here. Uh, a contractor uh, can be suspended or debarred. Uh, willful fa failure to perform or history of such failure pertaining to one or more government contracts. That's really the, the key one uh, as far as I'm concerned on this particular slide. Um, you don't see this a lot. Suspension and debarment in the world that I uh, typically operate in uh, happens most often where uh, uh, someone is being accused of something other than this. So, for example, I do a lot of uh, work in the small business world. So, if there is an accusation that a company is uh, falsely uh, portraying its status 
as a woman-owned small business or a service-disabled um, veteran-owned small business, you'll see um, suspension and debarment become an issue. When it comes to the failure to perform or the history of, the, of a failure to perform, uh, that's, uh, that's a little uh, different, and I don't see it as often. But again, I have an, a separate case where I'm dealing with that right now where the um, uh, debarring uh, officer has determined through a uh, contracting authority that uh, my client failed over the course of time to adequately perform on a series of government contracts. And as such, uh, it's been proposed for suspension and debarment. A little harsh, right? And, and the facts of my case, uh, are as follows. So the client had a series of three or four contracts with um, the government, and on the first two, there were admitted uh, issues regarding performance. Not terrible. Uh, the the project or the contracts rather were uh, were completed. On the third one, there were issues and problems. A new supplier was brought in. There was a supplier that had been a problem on the first two. The um, the client had discussed the issues and problems it was having with that supplier with uh, the contracting officer and um, thought that everything had been adequately addressed, brought in another supplier, and we found out that that supplier uh, was had, had issues of its own. We raised those issues with the contracting uh, officer. The contracting officer became annoyed at the fact that this is now a replacement supplier and we're running into the same performance-based problem so uh, they, the contracting officer deemed that to be our problem and proposed us for suspension and debarment. A little harsh, uh, the situation that my client finds itself in there, um, but it can happen. And it can happen based upon what uh, this particular subpart of the FAR allows for. So it's something that you need to be aware of if you're a government contractor and you're finding uh, you're having difficulty performing. Okay, if you can advance the slide. Okay, so this is a continuation of the prior slide. And this is interesting too. So uh, if there is a knowing failure, and this is shown by a preponderance of the evidence, by a principal of a contractor to disclose credible evidence of any of the things that you see here, uh, then that can lead to suspension and debarment. And the obligation to disclose that information lasts for three years after, after final payment on any government contract awarded. And not something that you would generally think about, uh, you know, after the fact, learning about any of these situations, but if you do, in fact, learn that any of these things may apply to a federal government contract that you do as a contractor and you fail to disclose it, it can uh, lead to suspension and debarment, which would then mean uh, that you are not qualified moving forward to perform uh, government work unless that uh, debarment, suspension, ineligibility can be adequately uh, addressed thereafter. Okay, if we can advance the slide. So what are the procedures? Um, the, they can be agency specific. Each, each agency is going to have uh, its own set of specific procedures, but generally speaking, everything is going to act uh, the same. There are uh, several general precepts that uh, sub FAR subpart 9.4 requires. Uh, for example, it requires the opportunity of a contractor to submit information to rebut or argue against the bases for proposed uh, debarment, right? There are uh, general due process uh, requirements there. So it's, it's, it's interesting going back to the whole policy notion identified by the government in uh, FAR Part 9.4. It's not supposed to be uh, imposed, that is suspension and debarment as a basis for punishment, uh, yet there's this uh, whole concept of due process, process uh, that's built into the um, the procedure, which it makes sense. It just uh, it's interesting that the 
policy is such that, boy, you wouldn't think if it, if it doesn't have anything to do with punishment, why do you need due process? Well, you need it for a reason, and it's, and it's good that they have it here. Um, there is a right to, to effectively face your accuser as it states here. Uh, there are documents that can be provided uh, to rebut the, um, the allegations of uh, impropriety that have led to the proposed debarment uh, or suspension. Uh, there can be witness statements provided. They can be uh, live or the affidavit. I've done a the affidavit before. Now, most of the time what ends up happening is these matters do resolve in some way. All of the uh, suspension and debarment matters that I've dealt with uh, in my practice have resolved in uh, some way, shape, or form. Sometimes uh, a client simply just has to face the music because it did something inadvertent or otherwise that it shouldn't have done. And uh, you negotiate, if you can, uh, a resolution that you can live with. Uh, sometimes if there's sufficient evidence that exists to exonerate the, um, the contractor, then it goes in a different direction. Uh, but in most instances, you're going to reach some sort of a resolution through negotiations with the agency. At least that's, uh, that's been my, uh, my experience over the years. Okay, if we can advance the slide. And what will result in either uh, suspension or debarment? Here we're, we're talking specifically about uh, a debarment, but the impact be anywhere from uh, one year to five years, depending upon the, the uh, severity of the allegations. If you've been uh, suspended for some period of time prior to a debarment, oftentimes that suspension period uh, will end up being taken into consideration. And um, there can be extenuating circumstances where additional time is tacked on to the end of whatever uh, the uh, debarment period is. Uh, it can also be reduced if newly acquired evidence uh, is provided or if there, for example, is an ownership change that would uh, result in or should result in uh, some sort of reconsideration uh, in the period of debarment. So all those things can happen. Okay, if we can advance the slide. All right, so let's, uh, let's go on to our subpart 9.5, organizational and consultant conflicts of interest. Conflict of, conflicts of interest come up. The idea is, uh, generally speaking, to prevent unfair competitive advantage uh, to one prospective contractor versus uh, another. And uh, there are times when the, uh, the nature of a relationship between a contractor and government is such that that contractor should not, is not permitted to qualify for a particular opportunity uh, given the relationship. And as you see here, uh, unfair competitive advantage uh, is defined as existing where a contractor pr possesses proprietary information obtained from the government without proper authorization, okay, or uh, where that, that contractor or a contractor has source selection information relevant to a contract that is not available to all uh, competitors. Uh, where do I see things like this coming up? Well, I've seen it in instances involving uh, construction contracts where You've had architectural uh, engineering assistance provided to help an agency develop uh, plans or specifications for a project. And then that uh, architectural uh, or engineering uh, person, people, company end up being a part of the team that is vying for that work. Now, in an instance like I'm describing, it tends to be uh, not architectural so much, but engineering, because you have some larger engineering companies that also perform heavy construction work. So you can see it in instances like that, and that's where I've seen it before. Okay, if we can advance the slide. These are some of the general examples. If you go into uh, subpart 9.5, there are um, more concrete specific examples. These are the general examples that uh, are provided within the subpart that identify instances where you can have uh, conflicts of interest uh, that can result in a disqualification of a contractor for a particular opportunity. The one I, uh, yeah, engineering technical uh, direction, I just mentioned something along those lines just a few moments ago. Um, 
specifications or work statements that's very similar to what I mentioned uh, uh, as well. The, the last one, gaining access to proprietary information from other companies as part of assisting government in, source, in a source selection process. Uh, I've seen that occur uh, before. So under the Brooks Act, the government has to go through a request for qualifications or RFQ process to purchase uh, architectural and engineering services as standalone services. And they'll often hire AE firms to assist in assessing uh, qualifications uh, for a particular opportunity. Now, if that happens, the, the companies that are a company or companies that are assisting the government in the selection process cannot also buy for those services uh, themselves, which of course makes sense. So that's sort of an example of what you can be talking about relative to that fourth, uh, that fourth bullet. Okay, if we can advance the slide. Okay, so let's uh, move on and talk about uh, FAR subpart 9.6, contractor team arrangements. Um, I work with companies all the time as it relates to um, FAR subpart 9.6. I mean, look, there are gonna be times uh, where a contractor cannot qualify for an opportunity all by itself. And in instances where that happens, uh, teaming in some fashion where you're combining resources with others can help a contractor that wouldn't qualify uh, otherwise to qualify. And as you see here, there are uh, two different instances of uh, teaming or, and what constitutes teaming under the FAR. You can um, uh, join with another company as a joint venture partner. Okay, so you're, you're uh, creating uh, a separate entity and working with one another as, as joint venture partners to, uh, to go after an opportunity and otherwise qualify. Or, or you can join uh, forces as as a prime and subcontractor, right? So that you can you can enter into a teaming agreement, and teaming agreements um, at the term of art, if you will, right? So they're uh, they're agreements that are typically in writing, and if you want the government to uh, recognize them, typically they have to be in writing and submitted at the time that you submit your bid or offer uh, to the government and. Uh, and I, in, as part of that agreement, the parties will identify how it is that they are complementing each other in um, uh, attempting to satisfy whatever the needs of the government might be for that particular opportunity. Okay, if we can advance the slide. Okay, so as we uh, talked about a few moments ago, the, the reason that you do it is to um, provide a way to complement what you can bring to the table with what someone else can bring to the table, but independently may not be able uh, to do uh, and satisfy uh, in terms of government needs on your own. Um, and it's also, as you see here, an opportunity to offer the government the best combination of things that the government needs for the purpose of solving whatever problem the um, opportunity represents. If we can advance the slide. Normally, the government will not play <clears throat> a role in the teaming arrangement itself. Uh, that is, it will neither uh, encourage uh, the, a particular contractor to team or not team or discourage. Um, all that the government will require of a contractor if it intends to team, typically, uh, is to uh, let, it, let it be known ahead of time, so before uh, award or before the, uh, the uh, arrangement is entered into, that it's going to happen. In that way, the government can then, um, uh, it, it can take a position one way or the other uh, in its own way as to whether or not it deems that uh, teaming arrangement acceptable to it. So in other words, it, typically what ends up happening is you have companies that will form either joint ventures or teaming arrangements, prime sub, uh, prior to the issuance of a proposal. The, uh, at the time that a proposal is submitted, it's made known as part of the proposal submission process that, hey, we're a team uh, and here's how we're going to work together government to solve your problem and to, uh, to assist you. And the government will decide whether it likes it 
by virtue of whether or not it issues an award relative uh, to that proposal that's submitted, or um, it may like uh, it may like the arrangement, but there may be an arrangement uh, from someone else, from a competitor of yours that it likes better. But um, at least that way, the government will have an opportunity uh, to uh, understand the nature of the relationship before uh, things proceed. Okay, if we can advance the slide. There are a few things uh, that you can't do as part of a teaming arrangement. Uh, you can't violate the uh, antitrust uh, statutes. I mean, obviously, you don't want to ever uh, enter into an arrangement that's going to end up resulting in a violation of regulation or, or law of some kind. Uh, can't do that. There was a problem that the dredging industry ran into uh, many years ago where uh, this became an issue. There was sort of this loose uh, teaming arrangement where uh, it was alleged that these dredging companies were making decisions about, okay, so who is going to bid low on this one and who's going to bid low on the next one? And, and that's what it, well, certainly you can't do uh, anything uh, along those lines. You also are not, as part of any uh, sort of teaming arrangement, allowed to limit the government's right to require consent uh, to subcontracts determine responsibility of uh, a prime contractor. Of course, we talked about responsibility already and the government's role uh, in terms of determining responsibility. And you cannot limit the government's right to hold a prime contractor responsible for performance. And many times what will happen if you're in a joint venture situation, the agreement will um, uh, require that each party to that joint venture is uh, responsible for assuring that performance will occur. Um, so, so a lot of times you can address performance, but ultimately you can't remove the ability for the government to hold whoever the prime contractor is in, the, in that uh, relationship responsible for uh, adequate and complete performance. Okay, if we can advance the slide. Okay, so, uh, and Quickly here, we're going to now just shift to um, FAR subpart 9.7. Uh, it's a very short section of FAR part 9. It relates to defense uh, production pools and R&D pools. Uh, you do have uh, the ability in situation, certain situations identified in FAR subpart 9.7 for groups to come together to obtain, perform, uh, either jointly or in conjunction with one another defense production or R&D uh, contracts. If that's going to happen, uh, and this is sort of a loose affiliation of companies, you're not talking about joint ventures, you're not talking about uh, teaming arrangements in the sense of, uh, in, in the manner in which they're described in FAR subpart 9.6, but if you're gonna have sort of this loose affiliation of companies that are coming together to uh, perform with one another, it can happen. Um, uh, in certain uh, circumstances, defense-related, R&D-related, as long as the arrangement is identified um, uh, ahead of time and is set forth in writing. And um, in certain instances, the SBA uh, will need to become involved, uh, Small Business Administration will need to become involved and to approve the arrangement. Uh, arrangements like this also need to be consistent with the Defense Production Act. Obviously that relates to um, the defense production pools that are identified in uh, FAR subpart 9.7. It, it's very similar to, reminds me to, reminds me of rather, uh, situations where uh, contractors come together uh, under GSA schedule uh, contracts. So you have GSA schedule contract holders that come together to form this um, loose association or, or, or team to collectively pursue uh, work. Those loose arrangements uh, are not covered by FAR subpart 9.6. They're also not covered by 8.4, which is um, federal supply schedule, uh, which pertains to federal supply schedules. But it's this loose association of companies that are collectively agreeing to, to help one another for the purpose of satisfying uh, you know, government requirements for a particular opportunity. Very similar uh, to the GSA schedule um, contract holders that do that. You have the same sort of thing happening 
relative to uh, FAR subpart 9.7. So that is uh, our review of FAR part nine. I hope I was able to provide folks with uh, a little information on how it works, what's covered. If folks have any questions at all about FAR part nine, please feel free to reach out and, um, and ask me. So I appreciate everybody listening this afternoon. All right. Uh, thank you again, Ed, for a great presentation. And uh, to you and to the audience, I apologize for the technological uh, difficulties we had earlier in the middle of your presentation. Um, if you have any questions, like you said, uh, about this part, please contact uh, Ed with this uh, information you see on the screen. And if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.